some really powerful words there. Words with a cutting Are you feeling the cutting edge on some of the words we've already had this morning? That wasn't a rhetorical question. Good. Please encourage me that we're all in the same place. There's a real cutting edge on some of these words this morning. I'm, so we're doing things slightly differently today. I'm going to preach sooner. And then I want us to go back and have a longer time of worship and ministry to follow this. So I'm, going to, I'm not going to preach for very long. Some people miss, you misunderstand. Some people went for the R, some people went for the yay. Yes, I should have made that clearer. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Don't patronise me. Okay, I'm going to preach briefly, and then we're going to have a time of, of response, and it's going to be cool. Yeah, come on in, don't worry, don't, don't be shy at the back. Um, so last week we started talking about um, this series in worship, soul music, worshipping in spirit and in truth. And just very quickly to recap what I said last week, if you've got time, go back and check out that message too, I think that'll be useful. But we talked about the paradox of music, how often we think of worship as being just about the music, the singing bit. And, and it isn't. It's a lot more than that. Worship is, is our whole lives. Worship is our everything. Um, it says, Jesus says, reminds them of the, the commandment in Deuteronomy. Love the Lord your God with your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. With your everything, in other words. And yet, and yet, music is still an incredibly beautiful, powerful tool that we should make full use of. It, it connects with us on ways that are deeper than we can understand sometimes. And that's really powerful for worship because a lot of what we're going to be talking about today doesn't make immediate, literal, kind of logical sense. It's about stepping out in faith. And I talked about three unhelpful thought patterns that can hold us back in worship. Remember, it was that head stuff is, is overall, you know, we've got to have lots of ideas. Ideas are more important than feelings. Maybe you were taught that, that, you know, it's ideas that are important, you know, feelings, emotions, physicality, that's not important. You can stand there stock still, feeling nothing, but getting lots of concepts being downloaded through the songs that you're singing. And, and it's like there's nothing wrong with ideas, there's nothing wrong with words, but worship is so much more. Why shouldn't worship? Why would worship not involve our totality, our feelings, our hearts, our minds, yes, but our bodies too? Why wouldn't it? Worship can and should involve our whole selves, our sights, our senses, smells, taste, touch. You know, there's so many ways that we can experience worship. We also talked briefly about feeling limited or feeling excluded by how musical you are, whether you've got a beautiful singing voice or a sense of rhythm or whether you've got your tone deaf and, you know, you can't quite keep it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That is not the be-all and end-all of worship. You are a handmade creation. You are handmade by God. God does not make mistakes. He made you, and he made you as a worshipper. To worship in some way, it'll be a way that is right for you and a way that he loves and enjoys. So let's enjoy finding out what our worship is, our authentic worship. And we also talked briefly about not getting weird, about beauty and skill and artistry and technique and all those good things. But equally not to denigrate the everyday thing, the widow's might, you know, the two small coins, all of it. God appreciates, God likes. You know, we were, Dave Steele was, was sharing at Nick's induction yesterday and there's a, a little expression he was sharing from a Brennan Manning story, which will stick with me, this chap saying, oh, how, what is this extra you've got this, to this older guy who just seemed to have this peace and this assurance? And this older guy said, you know what, I know that there's a father in heaven who's awfully fond of me. He's awfully fond of you. Isn't that beautiful? So there's, we can have a healthy engagement with excellence. It isn't about elitism. We can have a healthy engagement with excellence because why wouldn't we bring our best? Of course we bring our best, but our best will look different and it will mean different things at different times for different people. It's all about worshipping in spirit and in truth. It's all about going and getting in touch with the deepest core of our being, our deepest realities, perhaps deeper than we can even perceive sometimes. There's something going on in worship that is deeper than we can perceive. We might think, well, what, we're singing songs and, you know, something deep can be going on and almost certainly deeper than we can understand with that kind of literal cerebral part of our brains. 
And that's really important for what follows now, for what I want to share with you this morning. Because today, this is a message called Battle Cries. This is about how worship brings transformation. Last week was deep cries. This is battle cries. Worship brings deep transformation. It brings real change in real situations. But we won't necessarily always be able to explain that or make sense with that. There won't necessarily be a clear cause and effect like, you know, oh, well, I put my umbrella up and I stopped feeling the rain hitting me. It won't be that clear cause and effect all the time. Sometimes it might be. Sometimes we're doing something in worship and like I said last week, in this drama, that is this invisible drama that's deeper than we can understand, something is changing. And we can't explain it. We can't, we can't with our sort of logical, post-enlightenment, 20th century brains, we can't necessarily understand it. But it's happening. And we step out in faith and we see transformation. We see miracles. Not always what we'll see. We're going to unpack that a little bit. Not always what we would understand. But God is doing something. Today we're talking about worship as spiritual warfare. W- worship is warfare on, a, on this level, this deep level that I've been talking about. It's about changing things. It is the power to demolish strongholds and to bring healing and to bring freedom and liberation. It is about the power to change the atmosphere, to change the, the spiritual temperature of a place or a situation or a relationship. In a way, see, I'm using metaphors Because I have to use metaphors. It's about changing the spiritual temperature. That's what it does. It's what it's it's about. It's just like, it's why the subtitle of the series, of the session rather, is changing the key. Battle cries, changing the key. It's a bit like changing key music. Did you notice what we did at the end of that last song? There was a reason for that. So that I could use it as a teaching example. We changed key. We were going, did anyone not notice that? (laughs) The drummer puts his hand up. Fulfilling all of those stereotypes. Thank you, Alan. Never change. Never change. We changed key. We went from G to A. We lifted. We went up a tone. It's, and you, I don't know if you felt that, but we lifted. We, our, our voices went up one, one tone higher and through the melody. There's just a lift. And some composers are really clever at changing key in the middle of lines and that sort of thing. And you might not, if you're not particularly musical, you might not notice this. But you'll notice something's happened, probably. You might not have all the technique to understand what, but sometimes you'll hear the, 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 the key change. You think, ooh, the music's... There's, there's just little, ooh. Everyone go, ooh, with me. Just make me not feel so on my own. Um, ooh. There's a little moment. And sometimes, and that's a silly example, maybe, but sometimes worship is like that. It's not, well, you know, we, we prayed about this or we sang about that, and do you know what? The situation just changed. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it's not so direct, but there is a little... Hang on, there's a change in the atmosphere, there's a change in the temperature, there's a change in my attitude, maybe. There's a change in my state as I approach this situation, as well as maybe a change in the situation. So, worship is warfare. We have an enemy. There is a direction that God is moving. And there is everything which opposes that direction. There's everything that pushes back or gets in the way or forms an obstacle. And that's what we are pressing against when we press in, in worship. That, maybe that's why worship gets undermined, why it gets denigrated, why it gets problematic, why people fall out about worship styles. Well, churches break up because they don't like the music or this person's playing too loud or that's not loud enough or this or that. Worship in churches, anyone experienced that? Is it just me? Has anyone experienced conflict in a church setting over worship? Just me and Simon. Next, no, there's a few more hands. A te- few tentative hands going Yes, I wonder why. I wonder why. Is it because it's potentially one of the most powerful things we can do and the enemy doesn't like that? I wonder why. It's been, often been said, grumbling is the devil's praise music. I love that expression. <laughs> Worth bearing in mind. Next time you're feeling like having a little grumble. Yeah. We, we talked last week, and I'm, I'm going to just run through three stories quickly, but we talked last week about some of the ways in which worship can be undermined. or we, we can be kind of disempowered about worship. Our worship can become small and tentative and held back because of those unhealthy thoughts that I mentioned earlier, and, and there are probably many more. 
But this week, I want us to be giving thanks and praise for the amazing power of worship to change situations. I want to share three stories with you really quickly. And then we'll move into a time of ministry and worship and just be responding to the Lord in that. So the story, really well-known story from uh, Joshua about the walls of Jericho. And this is the word that comes to Joshua from the Lord. You shall march around the city, all the warriors circling the city once. This you shall do for six days with seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. This is the ark of the covenant, presence of the Lord. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests will blow their trumpets. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then all the people will shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and all the people shall charge straight ahead. They've moved into the promised land, if you don't know the story. They've moved into the promised land, and there are enemy peoples occupying this land that God's given them. And you can't just ignore it. You can't just keep going. There's a, there's a problem here. It's going to be in the background you know, forever if you don't deal with it. And when we hear a story like that, there's a temptation to rash. We're, we're, remember our post-enlightenment 21st century brains? We're going to go, I wonder if it was the shockwave of the sound of the trumpets that caused the... you know. There's a temptation to do that. Let's just not do that because we might miss the point. I mean, maybe, maybe not, but that's not what this is about today. Let's focus on the principles of the story that are at stake here. They are following the ark. It's the presence of God. The presence of God goes before, leading us where we need to go. So it's not just I'm going to demolish anything that annoys me. I'm going to demolish the thing that the presence of the Lord is leading me to. So we need to cultivate that sense of the presence of God. We need to cultivate that intimacy with the presence of God so we know where he's leading us. There's some beautiful kind of Hebrew poetry in there about seven. Seven is always about, remember the seven days of creation, sevens is all about, always about creation. There is about a new reality being created here. There's something, there's the way that things have always been. Maybe you know this. Maybe you've got situations in your life. There is the way that things have always been And it can never change, can it? That person is always going to be like that. That situation in our nation or our world is always going to be. That's just just the way things are. Really, God has the power of new creation, a fresh creation. So there's elements of movement, of physical enactment. Remember last week we talked about these things. We might think, well, that's silly. Why should I have to walk around? I should just sit here and download content. No, there is power in all of our bodies when it comes to worship. There is physical movement around the city, and I don't think it was about the vibrations of their feet that knocked the walls down. I think they could build walls a bit better than that in those days. You know, it's not about that. It's about physical enactment. It's about worship. It's about obedience. There's... um, There's sounds. There's there's the trumpet blast. There's the shout. Anyone ever had a really good shout, you know, a kind of primal scream moment where you're like, you know, maybe you go down the the seafront and out to sea, ah, it's incredibly good for you, isn't it? Not just to shout in rage at other people, but, you know, maybe when you're on your own, be kind to other people. But there is power in a shout. There's worshipful shouts. Anyone ever heard a worshipful shout in worship that breaks down strongholds? It's something physical. Again, it's about our bodies. And back to what we said last week, we can be a little bit about our bodies, but there's something powerful in our bodies, something visceral, something real, something that works on a deeper level than we can understand. These are all worship elements that we're reading about. And what happens? The walls come tumbling down. The stronghold is demolished. And a totally new situation, a new creation takes place. That is story number one, demolishing strongholds. The next story comes from 1 Samuel, chapter 16. It's all about David and Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. That's a really high up position. Saul sent to Jesse, David's father, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favour in my sight. 
And whenever the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. Lyre's like a you know, stringed instrument. And, and Saul would be relieved and feel better and the evil spirit would depart from him. Now, again, you might have read those verses and gone, oh, hang on, there's some bits in there I don't understand. What's this about an evil spirit from God? Park all that. Park it all, park it all. Don't let your 21st century brain take over. This is, again, a very complex story, and the story goes on, and you might know how the story goes on. But anyway, let's just take this for the principle it teaches us. Let's look at what's clear. David, the ultimate psalmist, the guy who wrote most of our psalms in the book of Psalms. Can you imagine what that must have been like in that setting? Him playing the lyre, singing for Saul. How amazing would that moment have been? And we see, as a result of that, profound transformation. Saul, this this very tortured individual, very complex individual. You know, there's a whole story here, but Saul is ministered to. And even in the midst of all that complexity, all that torture that Saul had, all the problems of of, of Saul as a character and, and his history and everything, but in the midst of it, we see respite and we see healing. David's worship brought relief. It brought peace in the midst of the storms, in the midst of difficult, challenging circumstances. And as I said, you know, there's a whole story here. There's the rest of the story. It's complicated. Life is complicated, isn't it? So sometimes we are moving through challenging times and God may have a whole story mapped out. And, you know, right here, right now, we're not going to see exactly the, the thing that we would love to see. And yet, worship can be a place of incredible respite and healing. It can be a calm in the storm. It can be an oasis in the desert that makes all the difference in the long term. You know, if you're going through something at the moment particularly, or if you've been through something, you know sometimes there's a whole journey, there's a whole process. But in the midst of the storm, worship can bring healing and respite. Last story. Paul and Silas. We read this in Acts 16, just I think last year, we, we, in our Acts series, we got to this. So I'm just uh, reviewing this very quickly. After This is Paul and Silas they're talking about. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell, the most secure cell, and fastened their feet in the stocks. They've been beaten, they've been flogged completely unjustly. Now they're in prison and fastened in stocks. Incredibly uncomfortable, incredibly humiliating, demeaning. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Well, wouldn't you? Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unleashed. You know, their response, they've been treated unfairly, unjustly, but their response isn't complaint. It's not resentment. It's not turning away from God. Well, God, I thought you were supposed to be. Oh, forget you. It's not that. They worship. They praise. They worship. They pray. Rather than turning away from God, they're leaning into God. They're drawing near to God. And I want to suggest to you that they are experiencing a freedom long before the earthquake happens. Don't you think? If, if you're in the storm, if you're in the, the most desperate of circumstances and you can be heading towards God and praising him and worshipping, you're already free. You're already free. Freedom from resentment, freedom from bitterness, these things which, which wither the soul and darken our experience. They were already free. But yet, still, the bars were broken. An amazing thing happened. An amazing transformation took place. However the chains have come upon you, worship is a wonderful gift that God gives us to see you set free. When you are under the cosh, when you are feeling in chains, when you're feeling in prison, worship. Maybe maybe you feel that 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 was your fault 
that you've put these chains on yourself. It doesn't matter. It's within that place of intimacy that you are led to that place of repentance. So even if you've kind of colluded, even if you've kind of, you know, not made some great decisions and you've ended up in that place of feeling bound and chained, it doesn't matter because in worship we draw near, like in seeking the presence of God, we draw near in intimacy and in intimacy we know that we find a God who loves us, who's awfully fond of us. And as we repent, as we change our minds, as we turn around from that, those old mistakes, we know that there is that loving Father with his arms stretched wide, welcoming us back home again. It reminds us we have a God who we can trust, who is awfully fond of us. So we're going to move into a time of worship just shortly, but I just want to kind of leave these thoughts with you, what we've been talking about, because this is a time of ministry. This is a time for us to be digging deep, not simply singing songs, but digging deep into worship, because we know that worship is powerful. Worship changes the situations. So three things for us to be thinking about as we worship together. First of all, strongholds. In your life, in your environment, in your community, in your nation, in your world, I wonder if, and there's already a yes answer to this, is there an enemy presence? In, in any sphere that you're aware of, is there something which you think, that is wrong, that is an enemy presence, it's like an enemy camp in God's good world, or in your life, in God's good life that he has created, there is an enemy encampment, an enemy stronghold. In our community, in a relationship, there's an enemy encampment. And you can't just ignore it. It's an obstacle. It's a problem. It will be a constant wound, and it's not going to get better all by itself. Maybe you know this. Maybe you've been in situations, and you've tried to make it better, but it's just not getting better by itself. It's just there. It's like a, like a tick in your skin. It's just there. It's a situation that seems just too tough to crack. Yeah, that person, that relationship, that situation, that issue, it seems as immovable and as hard and as unchanging and as unbreakable as stone, as walls of stone. But be guided by the Holy Spirit. Remember, it's his will being done. This is not just things that annoy me. It's his will be done. Where is the Holy Spirit leading you to be demolishing strongholds today? Not just today, every day when we come to him in worship. And as we worship, think like Israel. Think of yourself as surrounding that issue. Let your prayers surround that issue. Let your, your inner heart song surround that issue. And we will see the walls come tumbling down. Amen. Amen. Next thing to be thinking about is healing and respite. Come in this time of worship and receive healing, receive respite. You don't have to physically come. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. I'm going to hand over to Jo in a minute and she's going to kind of MC and curate us as we worship together. But receive healing, whatever that looks like for you. Now, it might be exactly what you would hope for. It might be that the healing might be obvious, but it might be less obvious there might be, remember with Saul's story, there might be a whole story here that needs to be worked out. And this is just a moment in that story. But even in this moment, God is so good and he's so loving and he wants to bring you healing and respite in this moment. Let worship be a place to be restored, to be, restored, to be reassured. Let it, let it be comfort in the valley of shadow. Strength to walk the path ahead with faith and trust and peace and lastly I want you to be thinking about freedom as we worship do you feel like you're held captive by something or it might be someone else that you know and you think I, I know that that person is in chains over a particular issue you know the the church outside of, of Paul and Silas's prison I'm sure we're praying for them as well do you feel like you're in prison? Do you feel like you or someone you know is in chains? Maybe it's unfair. Maybe it's unjust. Completely unjust. Not your fault. Or maybe you did kind of collaborate with this in some way. Maybe you did kind of walk into it. You made mistakes. There is temptation. There is always temptation. You know, 
But we, sometimes that's self-medication. Sometimes we, you know, because of the pains of life, we self-medicate. We self-medicate in all sorts of ways. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's a substance. Maybe it's an activity. Maybe it's, and it's something we do just to make ourselves feel better against the pain. But God wants to set you free from the pain. He doesn't want you to feel shame about the issue, about the medication. He wants to set you free from the pain. Cut it off at the root. Or maybe it's someone else, like I say, that you're aware of. In worship, we have the chance to reset, to yield to the Holy Spirit. Maybe we need to repent of something, and God brings freedom. He brings that change to the spiritual atmosphere, that change of key, and then we move forward however he leads us.